Hello and welcome to What's in the Night Sky for April 2025. I'm Hayley and this month we're looking out for a lunar occultation of the Seven Sisters star cluster, the Sea of Tranquility on the Moon and the constellation of Lyra along with the Lyrid's meteor shower. Let's begin by taking a look at the planets. You can see here that I'm looking towards the south on the 1st of April at around 9 o'clock. We do need to go out a little bit later for a dark sky now that the clocks have changed. And we have Jupiter shining brightly in the constellation of Taurus all month and Mars shining brightly in Gemini, making its way over to Cancer as the month goes on. You can see both of these throughout the whole of April, but the beginning of the month is a bit better for them, particularly Jupiter. If we take a look at how the picture changes, if we go to the end of the month, so I'm going to move us to the 30th of April. And you can see that Jupiter is much lower at nine o'clock and the sky is much brighter. So there's not much chance of observing at nine o'clock by the time we get to the end of April. So we're going to want to go to 10 o'clock. And you can see now that by the time it's getting dark enough, Jupiter is almost setting. So if you do want to catch Jupiter, then the, be the beginning of the month is the best time to do so. And you can see that Mars has made its way over to Cancer now from Gemini as we reach the end of April. The other bright planet to look out for this month is Venus, which is now a morning planet. So we need to go into the morning to see it. So I'm going to swing around to the east. I'm going to go back to the beginning of the month. And I'm going to go into the early morning sky. So here we are at six o'clock in the morning on the 2nd of April. You can see Venus has recently risen in the east. If we just go back a bit way to catch Venus is to find yourself a viewing location that has a nice unobstructed eastern horizon you've not got trees and buildings in the way and then wait for Venus to pop above the horizon be careful when you're observing so close to sunrise that you don't accidentally look at the sun once it's up especially if you're using a telescope or a pair of binoculars this will be quite challenging to spot because it's not very long before the sun comes up and the exact time of your sunrise will depend upon your exact location but you won't have very long with Venus before it's lost in the glare of the sun. If you want a real challenge you can try this on the 25th of April and bearing in mind that sunrise is getting earlier as the month goes on as we head towards the summer and on the 25th you have Venus joined by a very thin crescent moon just below and if we go in a little closer on this area we also have Saturn over here and Mercury somewhere down here in the glare so you could have a go at trying to spot these four see how many of them you can you can get Venus being the easiest then the moon then Saturn then Mercury. You can see with your binoculars sweeping around this area using Venus as a marker to see if you can find the other three. Moving along now to look at the moon in a bit more detail. So if we go back to the evening of the first where we were at the beginning and I'm just going to zoom out and go back to where Jupiter was in Taurus and you may have also spotted when I was talking that the moon is also in Taurus, very close to the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters open star cluster. And on the evening of the first, the moon will occult the Pleiades, so it will appear to pass in front of the Pleiades, this beautiful crescent moon. So if we watch as time goes by, so we're just after nine o'clock here, and you can use your binoculars or your telescope, your telescope with a nice wide eyepiece in, and you can watch as the moon makes its way across the Pleiades. And if I zoom back out again, about half past nine, you can see I've got a very unhelpful tree in the way here. So it's another one of those things where if you've got an obstructed horizon, it's going to mess with your observations because this is going on as the moon and Taurus are coming towards setting. But certainly you should be able to see the first part of it, even if you don't manage to observe the whole event. We can also follow the path of the moon through the evening skies over the first part 
of the month. So on the 1st, we're at the Pleiades. On the 2nd, the moon is very close to Jupiter. If we keep going to the evening of the 5th, you have the moon very close to Mars. In fact, close enough that you might be able to train your binoculars and see them both together. This moon that's just past half full and a bright Mars shining in Gemini. And then onwards to the 12th, when we have April's full moon. We can zoom in, take a look at the full moon, and that will lead us nicely into our moon watch target for this month, which is the Sea of Tranquility. Probably the most well-known and famous of the lunar seas because it is where Apollo 11 landed in 1969. And I thought for this month's moon watching activity, we could take a closer look at the area around the Apollo 11 landing site and see what we might be able to spot with our telescopes. So I'm going to move now into my more detailed lunar observing software and we'll take a look at the area around Apollo 11. So here we are in Lunar Quick Map, which if you haven't used it before, is a browser based software um, that uses images from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter um, to make up this lovely detailed map of the moon. You can see the Sea of Tranquility over here with its sort of crooked edge that it makes with the uh, surrounding uh, highlands and seas. It has a border with the Sea of Serenity over here in the north and um, the Sea of Fertility over here in the east. And if we zoom in, you can see that I've made two marks in uh, the Sea of Tranquility. One, um, a pink mark, which shows us the position of the first human-made object to impact the moon. And that was the Ranger 8 probe in 1965. So that's just had its 60th anniversary. And it took more than 7,000 high-resolution images of the moon um, as it was approaching. And to the south of Ranger 8 is the Apollo 11 landing site. So the site of the first human landing on the moon, um, Apollo 11. And if we zoom in, you can see that some of the features of that mission are marked. Um, so you can see this pink path that the astronauts took on their EVA. You can see where the flag was planted. You can see where some of the experimental packages that they left behind are. If you are observing with a small telescope, you're not going to, be, or even a large telescope, you're not going to be able to see any of the um, landing site. Um, any of the things that were left at the landing site because these features are going to be a few metres across at most and when you're observing with a, an amateur telescope you're looking at things a few kilometres across um, is going to be the best you can resolve um, and how small you can go will depend on the size of the telescope that you've got. But we can look at some of the features around the landing site and see if we can see how much we can make out uh, with our telescope. The first uh, things to look at are these two craters over here, um, and they are Sabine and Ritter. Uh, so Sabine, this one, is 30 kilometres across and Ritter is 31 kilometres across. So these should be within reach of um, a small or to medium sized telescope. Down here we've got this little tiny one um, which is Moltke and although it's small seven kilometers across it's very bright so for a small crater it's a, a bit easier to spot than it, it would otherwise be um, and the brightness of the crater is due to its ejector collar um, so this material that was blown out of the crater when it was impacted and makes it stand out against the darkness of the floor of the, the sea. Uh, so you can have a try at, at Moltke. If you've got a really big amateur telescope, then you might like to see if you can spot the three craters that are named after the three um, Apollo 11 astronauts. Um, so you've got Armstrong over here, five kilometres across. Collins over here, three kilometres across. And Aldrin over here, which is also three kilometres across, but a little bit less well-defined. 
when um, Buzz Aldrin stepped out of the lunar module, he described this area as magnificent desolation. And I, I quite like to think about that quote and what he was feeling when he was looking out over the um, lunar surface when he first set foot, um, as I'm observing with my telescope. Back to Stellarium now, and you can see that I've put my mouse just about where the Apollo 11 landing site is. And the only thing left to say, um, really, is to think about the best time of the month to complete these observations. So you can do it any time that um, the Sea of Tranquility is visible, but the best time to do it is around four days to a week after full moon or a similarly a similar amount of time after new moon six to nine days after new moon so that um, the area that you're interested in is close to the terminator and you get those lovely long shadows casting you it enables you to see things that you wouldn't otherwise be able to see um, so we're on full moon on the 12th so one day two days three four five six seven days after full moon so if it's nice weather you could explore the area from um from full moon over those few days until it disappears from view behind the terminator and then you can do the same thing again after new moon as it reappears if you are observing um when the moon is at one of its really bright uh, phases, then you might want to consider a lunar filter or a neutral density filter, which just goes on the end of your eyepiece and just takes the intensity down a little bit. Um, and then that helps to bring out detail that would otherwise be obscured by the glare from um, the enormous amount of light that's coming from the moon into your eyes. Let's move to our constellation of the month now, which is Lyra. I'm going to zoom out and you can see Lyra with the very bright star Vega shining up here close to Cygnus the Swan. So I'm going to go in a little bit closer and I'm going to put on the constellation art. Um, so you can see that Lyra is associated with a harp-like instrument um, and that instrument belonged in uh, Greek mythology to the musician Orpheus who played so beautifully that his music was said to even charm the trees and the streams. After his death Zeus sent an eagle to retrieve his harp and it was placed in the heavens along with Orpheus himself. Lyra contains the bright star Vega which is the third brightest star in the sky after Sirius and Arcturus. So it's a nice, easy one to spot. Um, the, r the rest of the stars in Lyra are not quite so easy to spot. And if you want to, to spot all of these stars, then you might want to try and find uh, a darkish location so that you can do so. Uh, Vega is also one of the stars in the Summer Triangle asterism, along with Altair and Deneb. So if we zoom out a little bit, and take the constellation art off again. Uh, so we've got Vega, Altair in Aquila and Deneb in Cygnus forming the Summer Triangle. Um, and you can see the Summer Triangle even from light polluted skies and they're a really good way, it, it's a really good way to orient yourself in the spring and the summer sky. And we can take off the constellation lines and the constellation labels and place the asterism lines instead um, and the asterism uh, labels and we can see the summer triangle over here kind of the sky looks very strange when you take off the familiar constellation lines and put the asterism lines on instead uh, locating the summer triangle is um, a good way to help you to locate the milky way um, if you're lucky enough to be in a dark location, then the Milky Way appears to go between the stars of the Summer Triangle. Um, and you can also um, imagine the Cygnus the Swan flying through the Milky Way as well. If we take off the atmosphere on um, Stellarium, then you can see much more easily um, the Milky Way. It's a shame that we can't move the atmosphere out of the way when we're doing our ground-based observations. But if you can get yourself to um, a nice dark location, find the Summer Triangle 
um, and then see if once your eyes have adjusted, see if you can spot the Milky Way flying through the Summer Triangle. So let's put the atmosphere back, drown out all of those faint stars and have a look at a deep sky object in Lyra. Um, and the one that I've chosen is a star known as the Double Double. So if we zoom in a little bit on Vega and we can see this star over here, it almost already looks like it's a bit smeared, like it's not a, a perfect point. And if you zoom in on it with a, a, a decent pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you will be able to see that actually you can resolve it into two stars. And if you have a larger telescope, you should be able to resolve each of those two stars again into another pair of stars. So there are four stars there all together um, in what initially looks like just one star. Um, and that's why it's called the double double. So it's definitely worth <clears throat> having a go at that if you are observing Lyra this month. The other thing that is happening in Lyra this month, which is why I chose it for Constellation of the Month, is the Lyrid's meteor shower. Uh, and you can see the radiant of that meteor shower up here. And that is peaking on the 22nd of April, the evening of the 22nd of April. So we'll go to the 22nd. And you so the best time to observe is the evening of the 22nd the early morning of the 23rd um, but you should actually be able to see lyrid meteors throughout the whole of the second half of april um, so you can observe any time that you're out you can see if you can spot any lyrids um, they can produce bright dust trails that glow for several seconds so although it's not one of the brightest meteor showers or one of the ones with the highest rate of meteors it's definitely still worth um, having a look and see if you can see any of those glowing trails um, the moon is out of the way on the 22nd 23rd until around four o'clock in the morning so conditions are ideal for looking out for some faint meteors um, whereas in some years the moon can be in the way and start washing out um, the meteors so that we can't see them um, the meteors, uh, we often call them shooting stars, occur when little fragments of rock or dust or ice uh, left in the wake of a comet, in this case, fall into our atmosphere and burn up, producing those lovely trails. Um, and the Lyrids is... Uh, meteor shower is produced by material left behind by comet Thatcher. Uh, and Thatcher has a, an orbital period of 415 years, uh, meaning that's how long it takes to orbit the sun. Um, and the Lyrids is the oldest recorded meteor shower that is still visible today and was first recorded in 687 BCE. Let's finish by taking a look at the International Space Station. And there are a few early morning passes towards the end of the month. I think the best one, um, the one that will be the highest and brightest and while the sky is still nice and dark, will be on the 29th, starting around 3.40 in the morning or just before 3.40. So if we go and have a look in the west and then we should be able to track it from west to east. Here we go over the course of five or six minutes till it sets again in the east. That brings me to the end of our night sky tour for April 2025 and I wish you clear skies for all of your observing this month.